um, I think that you're taking it very seriously. Obviously, you've written in this question. You're trying to do something about it. And it's okay to struggle. It's okay to not know what to do. You give a shit about her and her upbringing. That shows and that matters. Not everybody does care like you do. Um, some people are are more callous and you know, more selfish. And this is bugging you because you care about her. And I think that at some level, she knows that. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 196. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people, just like you. And today I have a nice question and answer episode for you. Uh, Three really good questions, a variety of issues we'll be talking about. Fair warning, (laughs) I'm a little loopy. I did not sleep like hardly at all last night. My two-year-old, Leo, has been going through this crazy sleep regression. He was sleeping great for quite a while. And actually like just like a really awesome fun kid and then he like knew when his second birthday was he hit two and suddenly like bam attitude like throwing himself on the floor over every tiny little thing screaming bloody murder and last night he was screaming from like i don't know two o'clock in the morning to like four or five it was a blur but it was several hours we kept trying to intervene and help and oh my goodness i do not miss this (laughs) So, um, yeah, I didn't sleep a whole lot. And then, um, I didn't have time during the day to get my workout in. So I just finished working out, um, at like eight o'clock at night. So now I am a little loopy and a little crazy. And I'm sorry if that comes through in the answers, because these are obviously serious questions that I'll be trying to help out with. I'll try to pull it together. (laughs) Um, but, uh, in terms of other announcements, things like that. The only thing is the, um, the sale or like the reduced price for the kick anxieties ass online course is still going. If you missed out uh, on last week's episode, I'm doing a temporary price reduction until, um, the 15th of next month. So, uh, right now it's, uh, February 18th and in March 15th, we're going to be, um, stopping enrollments, new enrollments in the course while we renovate and update and add new stuff and release a version 2.0. Um, but until then the price is drastically reduced from $300 down to $75. Um, and a lot of people have signed up so far. Um, a lot of people have, have jumped in on that price, which I'm ecstatic about. And, um, that's encouraging for me because my hope was, okay, let's see if lowering the price increases volume, um, of, of sales, which will, you know, hopefully balance out so people can have it in a more accessible price range. And then it's also still self-sustaining financially. So, um, I'm encouraged by the results so far, but we'll have to see for the, for the continuation. Um, if 75 bucks is too much for you, I I do understand. Um, there's another option as well. You can do monthly payments of 25 bucks. So hopefully that's, you know, attainable for almost anybody. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to go into all the details about the course. You can, you can check it out at kickanxietycourse.com, or of course there'll be links in the description. Um, but yeah, jump on that pricing now while it's super low. I don't know what I'll be pricing it at again once I, um, you know, re-release it in version 2.0. Um, and then to clarify one thing that some people asked about, you, so if you buy the course, um, right now, or you've previously purchased the course at any price point, you have lifetime access to that course. So it's not just the, you know, a, you, you don't just have it for 10 weeks or anything like that. You have lifetime access to it and any updates that I make, you're going to get. So it basically the course you're already enrolled in will just change an update. And I'll send out a notice about that, you know, when the time comes, but 
all that will happen is you'll log in one day and instead of seeing the course that you see now, you'll see the course that you see now, plus some extra stuff, some bonuses and all that good stuff. So don't worry if you feel like, um, you know, you oh, I already bought this and then there's gonna be a 2.0. No, you'll get all of that. And of course, right now it's the lowest price you're ever going to be able to buy it for. Um, and then you can still get all those future updates when they do come out. But even without the future updates, if you haven't checked out the course yet, it's really good. Um, it's very, very helpful. And I think that you will get a lot out of it even in its current state. So that's that. Let's go ahead and get into the questions. If you want the full show notes, check out depthofpsych.com slash episode 196. And let's get into it. Okay, question one reads, Hi, Dr. Duff. Love the show. Found it immensely helpful and was hoping you can answer a question I've been pondering for a while. I am a 39-year-old woman in the UK going through her third diagnosed bout of depression and anxiety spanning 20 years. I'm on citalopram and have been doing psychodynamic therapy for 10 months. The therapy has been really useful at identifying issues from my childhood that have caused me to struggle so much and for so long. No capital T trauma, but many years of emotional difficulty that I was under-equipped at the time to deal with. My question regards moving on to a different type of therapy. While my therapist is excellent, he is very much a psychodynamic therapist and has actually said to me in the past, this isn't CBT. I feel that at some point I'll reach the stage where digging around my past is no longer helpful and I'll need to find new strategies for moving forward. Is it accepted to move on from one type of therapy to another as you progress? I don't want to diminish the progress I've made through psychodynamic therapy, but I'm a very solutions oriented person. And I feel that at some point I'm going to need to try out some new ways of navigating this world. And maybe another type of therapy would work better for this. Is this something that people do? And what are the pros and cons of trying a different type of therapy? Uh, okay. So thank you for the really good question. First off, great job in doing the work and participating in therapy along with your medications. Um, you know, research really supports that strategy of if you're going to be doing medication, also doing therapy alongside of it. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's working out well for you and that you found some use out of the type of therapy that you're doing. Um, let's go ahead and answer the last question in there first, which is yes, it's totally accepted to move on to different types of therapy, to move from one type of therapy to another as you progress, or even just as your preferences or lifestyle changes. It's totally okay. Even within the same type of therapy, um, it's totally acceptable to switch providers. You know, if you're uh, doing CBT already, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, and you feel like uh, you're just sort of not clicking or something has changed with the therapist that you've been working at uh, with, you know, maybe after trying to fix it in some way and it's still not happening, then you're totally okay to switch to a different therapist. You know, I think a lot of people forget that while therapy is a sort of unique situation where you're, you're building trust and, and empathy and, you know, a really good working relationship with somebody, you're still the consumer in this case. And it's okay for you to shop around, um, that, that kind of diminishes it saying shop around, but you, you know what I mean? Like it's okay to try, different people so that you can find a good fit that's going to work for you. You know, after all, you're dumping a lot of trust and time and emotion into the situation and money. So you want to get something out of it. So that's totally fine. Now, in your particular case, so you've been seeing a psychodynamic therapist. Um, psychodynamic therapy is an interesting beast. So if for anybody that's unaware of psychodynamic therapy um, comes from the psychoanalytic traditions of people like Sigmund Freud. Um, so the classic model of this is long-term, um, a lot of classic therapy imagery that you've seen, like, uh, in, in movies or shows or, you know, cartoons, a lot of that comes from psychoanalytic therapy, you know, laying on the couch, free associating or talking about your mother in this sort of long-term week to week to week treatment. Um, that's the psychoanalytic model sort of. And the objective for these types of treatments, they're, they're based in the unconscious. So the, the objective is typically to figure out what these sort of unconscious wishes and urges and motivations are and bring them up to the surface through a variety of different techniques. Often it involves diving into the past and trying to understand sort of the origins of patterns. And it's a very relationship focused therapy, meaning you're looking at different ways in which interpersonal relationships have impacted you. Um, in some cases, actually even interpreting what's playing out between you and the therapist. Um, they call this transference and countertransference, uh, the actual sort of relationship that plays out between you, which might be echoing other relationships that you've had in your life and interpreting that in the moment in the room. It's really cool stuff and, and actually very useful. Um, the way that it's different from something like say CBT is that it's very open-ended. Uh, if you get yourself a, a classic, like a very classic psychoanalyst who's, who's old school, you might be having, you know, frequent sessions you know, week after week after week, sometimes multiple times a week, depending on the type of person, 
Um, it's becoming more and more rare to have this type of model because it gets very expensive, but, um, you know, you could be seeing somebody twice a week and you could be having sessions for years if you're doing a really classic sort of psychoanalytic treatment. Um, there are brief psychodynamic therapy protocols, which are shorter, you know, um, I think, what do they run seven to 10 sessions, something like that, and maybe even less, but this does not sound like what you're working with here. Hey friends, the hardcore self-help podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Being a psychologist is awesome, but one of the worst things about it is you basically sit on your butt all day talking or typing. And I know a lot of you have jobs that are like mine, very sedentary, no sense of physical movement or fitness involved. And that can be tough. Going to the gym is also really hard, making it routine even harder. So finding a personalized workout that meets your fitness goals is really helpful. That's easy now, thanks to our sponsor today, OpenFit. OpenFit uh, takes all the complexity out of getting fit. It's a new fitness streaming service that allows you to work out from the comfort of your living room or wherever you are in as little as 10 minutes a day. They've been adding so much stuff to the app. Uh, OpenFit offers 350 brand new live workouts every week. You can choose from classes like bar and Pilates classes, cardio, strength training, yoga, even guided walking and running sessions. All you need is your phone and a pair of headphones. And every Monday, OpenFit launches a new three-week live challenge where there's a different live workout for every day for three weeks. You can even connect with your trainer and classmates using the OpenFit live chat tool. Really cool. Like I said, they're constantly expanding the app. Really cool stuff now. They've recently integrated workouts from P90X, which you guys are probably familiar with. They also have a really cool program called Transform 20, which is a high intensity six week workout and nutrition program that helps you transform your body, your mind in just 20 minutes a day. Lots of different options and offerings. And the best part is it's affordable and accessible. You know, it costs a lot less than getting all these classes live and you can do it from anywhere. You don't have to feel the pressure of keeping up with your peers at the gym or, you know, keeping up the appearance of, of you looking good while you work out. You can do it in your living room, in your underwear, whatever you want to do. It brings it to you anytime. So that's great. OpenFit has definitely changed the way that I work out, and uh, by texting my code DUFF, D-U-F-F, to 505050, you can join me on a fitness journey personalized just for you. So right now, during the OpenFit 14-day challenge, my listeners get a special extended 14-day free trial membership to OpenFit when you text DUFF to 505050. You get full access to OpenFit, all the workouts, nutrition information, totally free. Again, just text DUFF to 505050. And of course, as a disclaimer, standard message and data rates may apply. So there's nothing better or worse about psychodynamic therapy when you compare it to something like CBT or ACT therapy, which would be acceptance and commitment therapy. In fact, there's actually some really interesting research. If you look up Shedler, S-H-E-D-L-E-R, uh, in 2010, he wrote an article that shows how depth-based and insight-oriented approaches like psychodynamic therapy can actually create more lasting and enduring changes over time that actually build up over time. So after you finish treatment, you actually get better over time, which is really, really valuable. But if you have a psychodynamic therapist that literally pushes back on you trying to build skills and do things that are active, saying this isn't CBT, you know, you're definitely going to have a limited scope in terms of what you can do with them. I believe that most therapists these days probably have a blended approach. Um, other terms would be an eclectic approach or an integrated approach where you basically combine elements of different types of treatment. Um, but that's not the case for everybody. And you still have some purists out there that are very heavily focused on one type. And that's not bad necessarily, um, but it's just you're getting what you get. You know what you're getting. And my personal belief in therapeutic approach is that both action-oriented and depth-based elements of treatment are necessary. So action-oriented, meaning solutions, things that you can do. Depth-based, meaning trying to build insight and learn about the origins of things like you are right now. Um, so in my approach, the CBT type work, cognitive behavioral therapy work, is going to help you establish some coping tools. We're talking breathing strategies, ways to challenge negative thought patterns, behavioral experiments to highlight sort of your faulty assumptions that you might have, and other practical things that you can do about your situation to have a handle on it. This is a lot of the stuff that ends up in the course that I talked about at the, at the intro. Um, and these are great for getting you through life and preventing your symptoms from totally just ruling every action and, and, and bossing you around. For me, I tend to call this phase of treatment um, stopping the emotional bleeding. You know, when someone comes in to see me, a lot of times they're they're essentially bleeding out emotionally. They're like, oh my God, I'm suffering. You know, the, the pain has gotten to the point where I need some professional help. Help me do something about this. And so it's okay. Let's give you a few, tool, few tools. Let's stabilize things. Let's stop that emotional bleeding. And then we can maybe look a little bit deeper as to what's causing all this bleeding in the first place. 
So when we get there, the idea is that, okay, you know, you've built some skills, you've opened things up a little bit, maybe you have a little bit more space to work with emotionally. Uh, medication can also have this effect, right? Where it opens things up, you're not struggling so much with the brunt of the symptoms, and you can focus a little bit more on some of these deeper issues. And as you stop suffering so much, you know, in this moment to moment struggle, that's when you have some mental space to consider these deeper things, such as where these patterns came from in the first place, where I learned X, Y, Z, all that sort of thing. And so that in my treatment protocol is where I tend to start integrating more of the psychodynamic and depth oriented approaches and techniques from there. Certainly I, I can, you know, sometimes it's, it's relevant at different parts within the sort of therapy process. You know, I'm not going to say, oh, no, 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 let's not get into that right now because that's going to come later. <laughs> you know, uh, in the same, I wouldn't do the same thing that your therapist is doing saying, hey, we're not doing that. You know, if somebody was, um, you know, in a session where we were maybe going through some thought patterns and, and kind of doing some exercises, if they started getting into some issues from the past and recognizing how maybe connecting some of the dots to now makes a lot of sense, I would run with that and I would help them integrate that sort of insight. I wouldn't say, nope, stop. We're not doing that right now. Um, but that's just my approach. There's nothing wrong with the way that you've gone through things. Um, I think that, you know, it sounds like you've been very open to diving deep into this psychodynamic therapy that you're doing right now. And honestly, that's a great sign for you that you're ready to make some real changes for yourself. Um, you're essentially just inverting the arrow of my typical approach. My typical approach is sort of a top down and then you're kind of going the bottom up. And I think that could still totally work for you. Um, one other thing to consider though, is that therapy is supposed to help you get better, right? Therapy is supposed to ideally, uh, improve your situation and research indicates that it can do so. Uh, research shows that therapy is effective for treating a wide variety of mental health issues. But I often run into people who have been in therapy with somebody for years, you know, and I'm like, okay, so is it working? And they're like, uh, what do you mean working? Like, how would I know if it's working? Like, well, are you feeling better? No, but you've been seeing this person for years. What do you do? Oh, well, you know, they're just really nice and supportive and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, but like, don't you want to get better? Don't you want to like improve things? So you can really get stuck in that sort of cycle. Um, to me, the ethical thing to do is to try to work myself out of a job to, to no longer work with this person because they don't need it anymore. And of course people can go in and out of therapy. You know, occasionally you might need to go back for a tune up or there'd be periods where you do need to be in therapy for quite a long time. But at least the goal for me is to try to like, like I said, work myself out of a job, give you tools, give you the, the things that you need to do to, to manage your life well, maybe give you some insight into where the stuff came from so it doesn't creep up on you unexpectedly again and then send you on your way. Um, I don't want anybody to be in therapy for their whole life unless they want to, you know, simply some people just want to, they want to always have someone to talk to and they understand that's what they're getting into. And that's fine. You know, if that's the agreement and that's the understanding, not a problem. But if you're sort of just treading water and not understanding why you're not going anywhere, that to me is a little bit more of a problem. So if you feel like you're stagnating, you're not making progress in therapy, then I think that you could do something about it. Um, it could be talking with your therapist about that fact and seeing whether you guys might be able to work something out, make some adjustments to push things forward, or it might mean looking for another type of treatment like you're suggesting here. So I think that is a perfectly fine idea. Um, nothing about switching. If you do switch should feel like a failure. In fact, I, I think that you might think of it as a sort of graduation. You know, you put in a lot of work, you made enough progress that you're ready for the next thing. And it very well could be that you go and do some more solution focused therapy, CBT, whatever model fits well for you, um, build up those skills, get some new concepts, think of things in a different way. <clears throat> and then, you know, after a while you realize, okay, I, I think I've done that work and I'm actually, now that I'm, I'm not suffering as much, I have a little bit more emotional space to get back to that sort of deeper digging that I was doing in the previous type of therapy. And maybe you go back to somebody who's more depth oriented, more psychodynamic, not a problem. These things are fluid. These things are flexible. There's no one size fits all approach. Um, even though uh, the research does say that uh, there's this thing called the master therapist model, which says that when someone's been practicing long enough, it, they, people tend to like look the same in how they approach therapy because certain things just work. Um, but that's neither here nor there. You know, you're allowed to switch people. You're allowed to try different types of treatment, especially if it's coming from a positive place and you're not just like, ah, oh, nobody can help me. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. No, you're saying this has been great. I feel like I might need to move on from this at some point and try something different. And that's totally okay. So thank you for the really good question. Hopefully that clarifies it for you and for anybody else who has a you know similar situation. So thanks. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. 
All right, we are back with our sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp, and it's H-E-L-P, help, not to be confused with health. BetterHelp is an app that has been a really great resource for so many people. If you have something that's interfering with your happiness, preventing you from achieving your goals, um, if you're struggling with anxiety, depression, any of these issues that many of you are contending with, BetterHelp can help out. They assist you by uh, assessing your needs and matching you with a licensed professional therapist. That's important. We're not talking life coaches or peer support. We're talking licensed professionals. And you can start communicating in 24 hours. It's not a crisis line, not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. And the people who work for BetterHelp, the counselor network, they have a broad range of expertise. So one great thing about doing online therapy in this way is that you might be able to get an area of expertise that's not represented in your physical area. Very, very important. And the service is available to clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get a timely and thoughtful response back. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't have to sit in the waiting room and do the whole thing that you normally do with in-person therapy. Um, BetterHelp is also really committed to facilitating a great therapeutic match. So if you don't like your counselor, make sure you do something about it. They make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. That match is important, so you can do that. It also tends to be more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. So BetterHelp and I want you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website, check out the testimonials at betterhelp.com slash reviews. And if you want to jump on this bandwagon, visit betterhelp.com slash duff. So better H-E-L-P slash duff and join the over 700,000 other people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. So the special offer for the hardcore self-help podcast listeners is that you get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash duff. All right, so question two reads, my 11-year-old daughter is beautiful, independent, and smart. I'm worried about her as I think I have ruined her. She's often lazy, she refuses chores, doesn't like to take her puppy out when asked. I know hormones are at play, but she often reacts very strongly to conflict or being challenged on anything. She sometimes ends up being very, very angry. She will yell, throw things, and cuss me out. She's always been very dramatic, but this is a new and scary level. She stated that she doesn't remember most or anything during these rages, but to me, I think that she's avoiding taking responsibility for trying any of my suggestions on how to handle her behavior. I'm a single mother. Her father was deported when she was a newborn, and she's only had limited contact. I've recently divorced her stepdad. We were together for a total of seven years. She blames him, as well as me, for all of her emotional strife. I will state that my ex was often harsh, and I also do not handle confrontation well. It's easy for me to get emotional. She was also very jealous of any and all attention paid to her four-year-old brother. I feel like I'm losing my chance to reach her before it's too late. I worry about her all the time. Please help. <sighs> so, wow, that's a, that's a tough spot to be in, and I'm, I'm sorry to hear this. Uh, thank you for writing in the question, though. I think that there's a lot to unpack here. Let me first address the very last thing that you said. You said that you feel like you're losing the chance to reach her before it's too late. I don't think that's the case. Um, I think that the worst thing that you could do in this case would be to minimize it and pretend like there's no issue, there's nothing going on, and that this is just something that you don't need to think about or acknowledge. And that doesn't sound like what you're doing. Um, I think that you're taking it very seriously. Obviously, you've written in this question. You're trying to do something about it. And it's okay to struggle. It's okay to not know what to do. You give a shit about her and her upbringing. That shows and that matters. Not everybody does care like you do. Um, some people are are more callous and you know, more selfish. And this is bugging you because you care about her. And I think that at some level, she knows that. So you need to have some grace with yourself and some grace with her. This is a tough situation. Um, you know, I wish life wasn't like this for you guys, but let's look at the facts here. You know, you have a young adolescent kid who's going through all sorts of normal changes, right? Physical changes, as you mentioned, hormones, identity changes, as you go through this normal developmental process of being an adolescent. Um, her father was deported before she was a ever able to really establish a relationship with him. She's witnessed a difficult relationship between you and your ex-husband that recently ended in divorce. You know, we can't forget that this is a recent thing. You said the divorce. So that's a lot And this little system of your family is going through a lot of crap right now. So it's normal within a system when there are changes like that for a reaction to happen. Um, people are going to react. And this is this this counts for everybody within the system. You, your daughter, um, your, your son, um, anybody else that's sort of in this bubble, it's normal to have some sort of reaction. Some people may turn inward, uh, maybe becoming depressed, quiet, 
um, feeling sorrow, guilt, shame, things like that. Some people may externalize, they may turn outward. So they have difficult behaviors, you know, they're yelling, acting out, doing inappropriate things, making bad decisions. It's a lot to adjust to, and it's normal for there to be a reaction on the part of everybody involved in some sort of way. Now, that doesn't mean that there can't be accountability, right? There can there can definitely be some accountability, and you can have expectations, boundaries, things like that. You need them. But just keep in mo- all this in mind as context, right? Uh, if, if there's going to be any time for somebody to act out, it's going to be in a situation like this, where it's like bing, bang, boom, so many different things have happened, and then there's divorce, and it's hard to feel stable, and it's easy to sort of flail and act out when you're not feeling stable. Sometimes there isn't this big mysterious reason for all these behavior changes. The answer might be staring you right in the face. And that's a good thing. You know, it's like, okay, you don't have to worry about figuring out why all this is going on. It's just more about trying to figure out how to deal with the situation, how to move forward, how to constructively do something about this. But you don't need to search for this, you know, big mysterious answer. Like I said, it's right there. So um, let's talk strategy a little bit. What can we do here? First off, uh, I think it's important to take a look at the relationship with your daughter as a whole. Um, obviously with the behaviors she's been exhibiting, there are going to be a lot more arguments. There's going to be difficult interactions and, you know, you're going to have fights and get at each other's throats and all that negative stuff that that's probably happening right now. Are you also though having good experiences together? I know it may not feel like, uh, you should be praising her or doing nice things for her or otherwise sort of reinforcing her more problematic behaviors that she's showing, but. Sometimes one of the best things that you can do to help balance a system that's out of whack like this is to try to increase reinforcement and increase positive interactions. You know, think of it like a scale and it's like, um, you know, definitely you can change the balance of the scale by removing things, um, by, you know, removing bad things, but you can also change that balance by adding good things to the scale and hopefully kind of find a more favorable balance there. And so that's one of the first things in a relationship, in a family, in whatever system is, you know, you want to think about, is there also good stuff? Is there some level of reinforcement? Is there some level of um, goodness and fun and praise and all that kind of stuff? Um, It's normal for resentment to grow uh, when you're feeling like she doesn't listen to anything you say and she's feeling like all you do is nag her about stuff. So try balancing that out a little bit with some of these positive interactions. Is there a way you can add in some special alone time with her to do something that you both enjoy? You know, is there a way to praise her or reinforce her for some of the things that she's doing well? And if you can't think of anything that she's doing well, that's going to be on you to try to push to recognize even the smallest things that she is doing well and praise those. This isn't going to solve everything, but sometimes bringing a little bit of that balance to the scenario suddenly gives her a reason to care more about it, right? So if she cares more about the system and the family, maybe she will be a little bit more, you know, willing and interested to contribute to it. However, um, I will say that at this point, with, with everything you have going on, I think that it also probably makes sense to integrate some professional help if you have not yet. Um, And even if you have, and it's just not doing the trick, maybe switching it up a little bit, as we talked about in the last question, I can think of a few ways that this would be helpful. First off, um, in enlisting the help of a professional or multiple professionals, it shows that you're taking the situation seriously. Um, she very well might push back against things like family therapy or uh, groups or anything like that. But at the very least, she knows that you're seeing how hard this is for everybody. You know, you're acknowledging that she's having a hard time and trying to do something about that. And it's one of those things that even if she pushes back, at least she knows that you're taking it seriously and not ignoring her. Um, If there are parenting classes available to you, these could be very, very helpful as well. Um, There are a variety of ways to find them. You can simply Google, you know, parenting classes in your area. It's best if these are probably through um, a healthcare organization. So for instance, in my my pre-doctoral internship, I was working for a, um, a big healthcare organization called Kaiser Permanente. And we did these behavior modification classes with parents that were, you know, several weeks long. Um, very individualized. We took examples in in the class and worked out, you know, behavior plans for the kids. And it was a really, really, really valuable class for for the people that took it. And in these sort of more behaviorally oriented classes, they focus on how to effectively use reinforcement, reinforcement and punishment. So, you know, it may be that you need to 
pay attention to what sort of things are reinforcing for her and work with that. So for instance, even withholding certain things that are high value for her so that she can earn them with her better behavior. Um, one thing that I've seen a lot of parents do, especially around this age range where kids start to sort of individuate and develop interests and passions and things like that, is they become afraid of taking away the kid's main thing. Um, so getting very personal here, for my little brother, this was music. My parents would never take away his guitar or remove him from any involvements having to do with music because they just felt like it was the wrong thing to do because it was his passion. Um, but it was also the only thing he cared about. And so as a result, none of their demands or requests or disappointment, none of that stuff had any teeth to it because there was nothing else that he cared about. He was fine. If he was going to be in his room all the time playing guitar, that's all he wanted to do. So, you know, I think that this isn't all about withholding and taking things away and all of that, but, um, you might need to find some sort of, um, leverage here. And, I would highly suggest, you know, either taking classes or meeting with a private parent educator, whatever you can make happen to help you identify the best strategy for this particular situation. Cause I'm not going to be able to provide that for you here without getting really deep into this and, you know, asking you a lot of questions and figuring out what's happening within your system. I will say though, that when making these adjustments, if you make some of them, it's normal to have pushback. You know, when you try to disrupt a system, it pushes back, like I said. So when you try to make adjustments to, you know, the way that she behaves and the way that you're interacting with her, you're going to see some pushback. You know, you might have a spike in the behavior before it goes down and that's normal. You also might want to take it gradually, you know, rather than saying, okay, we're making this change. We're shaping things up. I expect you to do these 20 things consistently all the time. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do this. Otherwise you're not getting X, Y, Z. That's going to be a bit too much probably. Um, but you can communicate that something needs to change. And I do suggest that you be honest about it saying, Hey, We've been having a hard time with each other. I expect different things from your behavior, not because I'm a hard ass, but because it's just, you know, how normal families need to interact with one another. We need to have some expectations and some boundaries with this. I have some things that I want to change for myself too. For you, we're going to be changing a few of these things. And so you can talk about the fact that you're going to be working toward more personal responsibility and sort of outline a plan. And then gradually start changing these things. Start with a few things instead of starting with everything all at once. And then, you know, I think that if you haven't yet, it sounds like maybe you have to an extent, but you try to lead her towards some helpful resources. Uh, it really can't be you that teaches her things like how to be better regulate her emotions, you know, take a deep breath, do things that are going to, to help regulate those strong emotional reactions she has. That's going to need to come from either a professional or other resources, books, videos, podcasts, whatever might reach her. Um, you want to try to lead her toward those because uh, it's going to work better than you trying to, you know, say, Hey, do this instead. She's going to be like, well, screw you, mom. You know, <laughs> you're, you're sort of in the eye of the storm with her. And so it's hard to make a difference from that, from that, that vantage point. Um, but she still might need some of those tools. And if she can find them through a different way, that could be very helpful for her. But overall, again, I just want to reassure you that this is not a lost cause. You haven't screwed anything up and you don't need to get all of this right. It doesn't need to be, I don't even know what right would be. None of us know what the fuck we're doing. You know, <laughs> none of us parents know what we're doing. We're just trying to make it the best we can. And when there's a lot of hard stuff that happens like divorces and deportations and all these other big life things it's hard. It's hard. It's really hard. So you're doing the best that you can. You're trying to find some more ways to, to approach it. And that's okay. You don't have to get all this right. It's incremental. You know, you can change it bit by bit over time. Express your love and care and concern for her. Let her know that you're trying the best you can, that you want to make sure that neither of you are suffering and let her know the ways that she is treating you, you know, um, that they're not acceptable. Even if you understand that it's due to so many hard factors that are out of her control, you're not going to judge her for it. You don't judge her. You don't say you're a bad person or you're a bad kid for this, but boundaries need to be in place. So she's a good kid and you know that. And because of that, there are some things that are going to need to change and it doesn't have to be the end of the world. So you have time. You have time to continue communicating, clarifying, trying things out. I know it's hard, but don't do it alone. Pull in whatever resources you can so you're not going through it alone. And uh, I think you're going to be okay. So thank you for writing that in. Okay, on to question three. Quick background is my mother is, I believe, unmedicated bipolar. 
I've worked in medicine and psych long enough to understand the telltale signs. From the time I was a child, she has been emotionally, verbally, and physically abusive. I'm almost 30. I have a longtime boyfriend, and more often than not, I am ruining him like my mother did my entire family. I took a confident man and literally broke him. He has an ex who used him for five years repeatedly, leaving and coming back, and I have a severe fear that she'll come around. Part of me will not let that go either. Uh, July last year, he left me because I wasn't fun, in air quotes. Apparently, he was sick of my abusiveness. I guess my questions are, one, how do I stop being my mother? And two, how do I trust he won't leave me again? <sighs> okay, so um, this question, I, in reading through it, you are putting so much judgment on yourself. You know, I think it's great that you can recognize and maybe push back on some patterns that you've noticed, especially patterns that has sort of been handed down to you, which is important, but this probably isn't all on you. There are two people in the relationship and you need to remember that as a therapist with a strong cognitive behavioral background, you know, my first instinct is to question whether these assumptions I'm hearing, you know, that you took a strong man and broke him, that you're being abusive, all these terms you're using, are these things actually true? You know, these terms can be somewhat vague. What would be abusive to you? What would breaking somebody look like? How do you know that these are the case in your situation? So I would encourage you to definitely challenge those, um, maybe even asking other people outside of the relationship for feedback about that. Have you actually been abusive? Have you broke him? I mean, that's a lot of responsibility to be placing on yourself, a lot of judgment to be placing on yourself. You said that he left back in July because you aren't fun. That d kind of sounds like a bullshit excuse to me. <laughs> that's not you know, really a good reason to leave somebody. And that doesn't sound like you broke him. Um, sounds like there's more going on there and there may be some issues within the relationship between you guys, right? Um, not just your symptoms or his symptoms or something like that within the system between the two of you, that's, that's sort of unbalanced or not working well. Um, the other thing is there's obviously something that you're both getting from this relationship. If you're still together at this point, there's something that you're getting from it. Um, you, you said that it's been a long term. I don't know how many, how many, you know, years or whatever it's been months, years, whatever. Um, but clearly there's something keeping you guys here despite some of the hardships that you've been through. So look for those signs as well. Look for those things. What are the reasons that you're together? Um, a lot of times we put so much focus on what's wrong and we totally lose sight of the things that are good. And it's important to look for those things. Again, though, I, I do think it's important for you to notice the patterns that you're talking about. Um, given what you've been through, I think it's definitely understandable for certain behaviors to be handed down from your mother, or at least sort of echoes of your relationship with her that might be playing out in other relationships, such as this one. Um, but in terms of what you can do differently, that's right. You said, what can I do to stop being my mother? What can I do differently? Uh, you could do something about it. You said that your mother is, you said unmedicated. I'm assuming that means undiagnosed um, with bipolar. And I assume that means she hasn't gotten any type of treatment or put any effort into taking ownership of her behaviors from your perspective. So rather than letting the swirling vortex of your own thoughts convince you that you're the worst person in the world and that you're destined to ruin everything good in your life, maybe you can consider getting a therapist. Um, working with an individual or a couples therapist or both might be a great tool to find a new way of living life and working through things rather than avoiding them. Uh, obviously this relationship is important to you, but I think that the issue here is even bigger than just this relationship. The relationship may or may not last, but it does serve as a really good opportunity uh, to practice a different way of being with somebody that you care about and maybe working through these patterns, uh, things that I would call sort of a corrective emotional experience, trying these things in a different way to sort of undo the learning that you have from the past generated by previous relationships, familial relationships, things like that. So the lessons that you learn from this period of time, they're going to stick with you regardless of the outcome of the relationship itself. So, you know, as always, I also think that communication is super important practice communicating with one another consistently, openly over time. Try not to make assumptions. You know, when you make assumptions, then you're reacting to things that you don't know whether they're true or not. And you can often let things build up when you're just making assumption after assumption without actually addressing them. And then when that happens, they explode. And so you don't want these things to build and fester and eventually blow up. Instead, address them as they come up and talk about them. Um, like I said, there's a reason you guys are together. If you look toward that reason as sort of the fuel for trying out these new ways of being together, practicing the communication, intervening with therapy for yourself, 
um, trying to maybe get some outside perspectives to stop judging yourself so harshly, all of that stuff, then you can take a big step toward not being your mother, as you put it, and kind of breaking that cycle. Um, and to be honest, that's all I have to say about that question. I know it's a shorter response than most of mine, but um, let's keep it let's keep it quick and to the point. Um, so thank you for that question. And with that, that is the end of the episode. Um, before I go, let's go ahead and read the bonus question. So this is the uh, question that I will be answering for the Patreon audience, uh, patreon.com slash death the psych, if you want to check that out. Um, in addition to weekly bonus questions, or well, every time I do a Q&A, so bi-weekly, I suppose, uh, bonus questions. I also i am going to be doing uh, another episode of the uh, Duff the Life podcast, which is with me and my wife. We're going to be doing another guided relaxation this month. Um, I've been putting up videos here and there about just general psychology concepts and mental health stuff and uh, lots of other good goodies and bonuses. So here is the bonus Patreon question it reads, hi, Robert. I just listened to your episode leaning into depression with your wife. And I was really impressed by how open you both were about her struggle with depression. I could hear in your voices that deep emotion that comes with overcoming life's obstacles as a couple. I don't have children, but I am a wife and I've had some mental health difficulties on and off for most of my adult life. My question is, how do you protect the person you love most in the world from yourself and your struggles? I try not to be a burden to my husband, but I'm also desperate to lean on him sometimes. Thank you for all your amazing work and your openness. So that's that. This has been episode 196 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. Thank you very much for listening. If you want to learn more about me, go to duffthepsych.com slash start here. And then if you want the full episode notes, duffthepsych.com slash episode 196. And have a really, really good rest of your week. I will see you for the next episode. Bye.